Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast. This is the podcast where we explore how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. This episode is part two of a conversation on innovation with Dr. Andy Root, Dr. Michael Binder, and Dr. Dwight Shiley. If you want to hit part one, go to your favorite platform and look for that episode. Otherwise, enjoy. So here's here's my question. I'm going to I'm going to throw something back at Andy. Okay. Cuz right? I want to answer that too. So yeah, you yeah, can come ahead. back. All right. <laughs> Is do you imagine a different way of leading to make the turn that you're trying to do? Yeah, well, one of the ways that I want to push into leading is, first of all, to really hold up the language of what it means to minister and what it means to be a pastor and what it means to think of a community as a community of ministers and pastors, that everyone is participating in ministry because ministry is the form of God's action. So how do we form, how do we share in God's being is by taking the form of God's action and God is a minister. You know, this is to echo which maybe I said on the other podcast, Robert Jensen's point is whoever God is, God is the one who frees Israel from Egypt and raises Jesus from the dead. In other words, the God we can know is the only God we can know is the God who acts. And this action to add to Jensen, my contribution to Jensen um, is simply Did to he say- Did he ask for it? He didn't ask. Okay, he, just check it. He, he, he's dead. Uh, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't ask for it. Um, but uh, is that whatever that kind of action is, it's an action of ministry. It's bringing life out of death. It's, it's, it's bringing liberation. It's bringing wholeness. And so to, to participate in God's being is to participate in God's act. So having a community of ministers becomes really important. So I may need to use some kind of design theory to create an environment where we're ministering to one another. But I just wonder if the language of, of ministry doesn't become more robust. And so all of the actions that I think in my books that are the forms of leadership end up taking on this certain theological perspective, which they are embedded in a certain disposition of passivity to. They're in a sense of giving and receiving and even acting out of invitation towards something. So there's a, a, a deep sense of what it means to pray. Like my, my biggest push is what if pastors just saw the point is, is to echo Eugene Peterson as their job as the pastor is to teach people to pray. Um, and that is in a sense an innovation to teach people who have never done direct address to God before a way to do direct address to God is a huge innovative process. But does it help them to say, now we're going to do an innovation or does it help them to think of acts of formation within? I mean, you guys are trying to recover the traditional language too. I mean, that, that, that's my, that's my question. When does All it right. help? When so does it So there's hinder? Andy's response to leading. Yeah. How, what would you like to? Yeah. Well, just, I'll give a more, a little more context around, you know, I came to Luther Seminary to study the missional church and kind of really this out of this theological commitment that Michael referenced earlier. And, um, and at the time here, a lot of that work was kind of very high level, pretty abstract. And, and so I kind of spent enough time trying to get congregations to become quote unquote missional. Like you're right, it's about joining God's, you know, activity and movement in the neighborhood and all this stuff. And I get these blank faces from people like, I don't want to become missional. Like, what does that even mean? And uh, it's, it was so strange to them that, um, that, that the, the leadership practices that we've, you know, kind of worked on and, and curated and developed in this have been a way to try to help congregations take steps that are transformational in connecting with God, each other and their neighbors in a very kind of simple, actionable grassroots way. Um, so that, that often the presenting thing that congregations want is they, they will say, we, we know we need to innovate. That's how the language that they'll use. And that can get channeled in really unhelpful directions around, if you think of so much of the church growth movement was still essentially in the cultural framework of Christendom, we assume there's a kind of latent Christianity that people have that we can kind of reactivate and get people to come back into the church if we offer the right techniques. A lot of it is technical. Um, but when you say, no, we actually don't know how to take this journey, like it is an open-ended journey, as Michael's saying. Like we, So really what we need to learn how to do at the basic level is to obey and follow God and the, the discern spirit. So, so we talk a lot about a discernment-based 
approach to leadership. So I believe the Holy Spirit is the primary leader of the church and that the work of leadership is helping a community um, pay attention to and practice being led by the Holy Spirit, both personally and also communally, particularly with an eye toward the neighbor. And, and that's where I think the conversation can default otherwise into how we just fix this, this social club that we have or this organization that's, you know, we feel cared for in it because the pastor does it for us or whatever. And then you never get to Lydia. And so I'm always, probably because I grew up out to the church, I'm always like interested in Lydia. And so far as Lydia's our spiritually curious but unaffiliated neighbor who's outside the gates of the structures by a place of prayer, wherever, whatever that is in today's world. Fastest growing group of people in yeah. the religious landscape. Right, in exactly. In the United States. Yeah. yeah, I guess I would just add, I think, I think there's two different questions then, right? There's this language question, like wh- how we talk about things that may make it easier or harder for people. And I agree with you that it might be that we need to drop the word innovation. But then we'd also have to keep paying attention to the to the epistemology of innovation to make sure it's not even sneakier because we're just not saying it. Um, I would also say that in, in real world experiences that I've had, people bring those assumptions with them, whether you say it that way or not. And even if you spend 20 minutes explaining, here's our way of thinking about innovation, they still think about it in the, in the Apple way, right? And the same thing with the word ministry that 90 some percent of people who hear you say you need to be a minister, they think you mean you should sign up to go to Luther Seminary. And then you spend a lot of time explaining, no, that's not what I mean by that. So I guess an open question is, how do we not spend all our time redefining the words? Um, Or are there other words, like to your question, that we could use that wouldn't require so much redefining? But it feels like part of the issue of the moment um, nationally is that we are having a hard time defining words in general, and we do need to spend some time clarifying what we mean. But those presuppositions are coming into those conversations kind of whether we like it or not. And I don't know that we can redefine them. I mean, practically, can we help people understand what we mean if we mean something different by innovation or minister? Sometimes, not all the time. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's that. that is the the big wager here is actually the, is the work to just, I mean, this sounds a little, a a little stilted, but is it only to define the words? In other words, is it to take people deep inside of this kind of reality and are human beings formed and changed inside of language? I mean, is that how you change imagination is that you have to give people different ways of, of talking and, 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 you know, you guys are, you guys have already had this kind of operative anthropology is that you actually are transformed by doing it. So, you know, you, you, you don't tell people, this is how you pray. You start to pray, but there's, you know, there's a similar logic in there, which is you talk your way into believing. Like it's, it's in the midst of, of talking like this and speaking like this, that you, you do that. So, you know, there is a lot at stake within our, our language games on, on how those play out. And, and I think you're right. There's a a kind of sneaky perspective that could arise even if we don't do the work. But I think one, one of the places we share, and even Dwight, you mentioned when you came here, is there is an inherent hermeneutical nature to this, you know, that that the way leadership happens is a fundamentally interpretive process. I mean, that's what you're saying, interpreting what, what God is doing and interpreting how the spirit is the primary leader. That calls for visions of language of how you're going to describe that, how you're going to articulate that, which is, a, and I guess my question for us, and maybe mine's naive, but isn't could it be that certain poetic language, say that's embedded more in the disposition of the psalmist, is more helpful than this kind of pseudo creative business language? Yeah. And, and I don't want to I don't want to bifurcate those so much because I think when you live in an environment, there there's going to be cross fertilization of that language. But do we need to put an emphasis more on one over the other? That's that's really my question. And what what does that do to us? Yeah, I like just testing that out. Yeah. Like, let's, you know, give it a try and see if this helps or that helps. My worry always is Christians talking like Christians in ways that people who aren't Christians can't really understand what we mean. And so. But here would be my pushback right now is in the midst of this, um, that 
the way we are talking right now, I feel like, has been completely co-opted by two responses to the loss of capital. And one of them is that we have a bunch of people within our church and pastors that we're forming to be techno-optimists. And this is a phrase I, I, I take from Robert Gordon in his book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, where he talks about there's part of our issue is there's just not growth out there. Like we haven't had really growth in GDP and standard of living since the 1970s. And mainline Christianity just thrived when GDP was at two or three percent. And since it's been below two percent, evangelicalism was much more, much more shaped to be able to respond to the headwinds of low GDP, to kind of fight in a neoliberal capitalist time for for market share than mainline than the mainline was, but the mainline could live off of all of these excesses of its golden era. And we haven't had that. And we've been below one percent. And so Gordon will talk about this as a larger economic frame is what ends up happening is you have a group of people who are just optimistic that some new invention is right around the corner that will get us the GDP growth. So, you know, will it be robots? Will it be AI? What will it be that will bring this growth in all of the networked innovations and um, network inventions have not brought GDP growth. Like it's been negative GDP growth, the smartphone and um, social media, because GDP is linked to um, productivity of workers and those don't seem to help. Those, those they inventions, don't? yeah, believe it sure? or not, believe it or not, they don't, they don't seem to help it. So that's one is that I think it becomes very easy for our language then to become all about techno optimism. But the other side that's just as connected to this kind of capitalist logic of, of, um, acceleration of, of escalation is a kind of identitarianism where inside the network, what you need to grow is recognition for your unique identity. And this is Emmanuel Castiles has talked about this in the 1990s. He was saying, we're going to have this huge identity revolution because inside the network, this will become a capitalist move. How do you build recognition and attention for your unique chosen identity realities? And across the main line right now, I mainly just see techno optimists or identitarians. And those two seem to be fighting with each other. But what's really fascinating is they're both capitalists. They both are really about the logic of escalation. In, in different ways. And I wonder if most of the time the way we talk is not in this deep sense of what it means to obey, what it means to be forgiven, what we think about sin, what we think about the word. We either talk as techno-optimists or we talk of identitarians and then create all our moral frameworks out of those two. And then we, we obviously, we can't talk of, we can't really use some of this deeper language about how God acts because we've been framed by those two realities. Yeah. And so, and I think along those lines, I think that's really helpful. The underlying theological anthropology, you know, that human nature is basically good, which under, under, uh, girds both of those ends up being this really pernicious force for when you're trying to actually, uh, name God's action and think about God's, you know, coming to us in our suffering and loss in our inability to act, particularly the inability to choose the good. Um, but, but I think, I mean, I, so I think here's what I'm curious about, and you'll jump in on this, is, is I um, spend time with pastors and, and out kind of around the church. There is a sense of, of a lot of that also being really exhausting and kind of just fatigue even from that too. Like people, there's a certain energy around doing the identitarian move that um, people can find. And it's also really tiring too, right? And divisive ultimately, because it's about achievement. You still are having to perform and achieve yourself. Competition. Yeah, and competition. And so, so I wonder what the Holy Spirit is doing in this moment in our in our culture, as so many structures do unravel and can't be fixed, you know, in their old way. Like a lot of the mainline, the assumption is we can just somehow rescue or preserve these certain forms of whether it be congregation or denomination or judicatory, whatever. Um, that, that I don't think will actually work. And so I'm where I'm always telling people, you, we, we can't fix this. It's like not fixable. And I really, so what, what do we do instead? We listen to scripture, to the word, to learn to listen to God. And we do that really concrete ways. And we have to do it in ways that bridge out to the neighbor and to the neighbor's stories. And insofar as the logic is we are this volunteer association of people who are, you know, here to get our, our spiritual needs met or perpetuate a certain set of cultural traditions or whatever it might be, music, liturgy, um, the neighbor and the neighbor's suffering 
just just recedes in the background. And, and we've had, Michael, you speak for yourself, but we spent a lot of time trying to get mainline churches to um, care maybe, maybe it's not too harsh of a word, honestly, about those neighbors who don't know the gospel. And, um, and so part of what we've tried to do in this is what are practices congregations can use to take them on that journey that bridges into both experiencing God's energy, the Holy Spirit's energy is very different and drawing them into relationship with neighbors and even deep relationships with each other in a more authentic way, like a more you know vulnerable way. Um, and because so much of how they've experienced church is not designed to do that. Um, I think a lot of evangelicals sometimes have a motivation around that where if you believe people are going to hell, like there's a, like, let's go, go out there. But, uh, you know, very few mainline people believe that. And so what you end up with is, well, they're just all doing their own nice thing. You know, they, you be you out there. <laughs> we have our thing here. We'd like people to come in on our terms, but that's less and less plausible now. So what do we do? Like what we're at a loss. And I think the loss is actually the moment of, promise in a sense. But you wrote a book called Promise of Despair, yeah, right? Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think it's a huge question um, about how we define what growth is. And, yeah. and I guess that's my that's my biggest concern is that we always see growth at, in this uh, in this logic of escalation. And and I do think, you know, so th this is the project I'm working on now is like thinking if you, if you, Michael's point is, well, can we, can we, does language help us or do we end up finding ourselves caught in this kind of language called a sex too? So maybe, you know, to put the Protestant tradition with the Orthodox one, that the icon also is a word event, you know, but it, it doesn't come in, in words, it comes in an image. And I think there are two interesting images if we were then going to you know, accommodate to the cultural reality and make memes of, of this. You know, there is a sense where we think what will save us is... Accommodation or translation? <laughs> maybe it's translation. Maybe it's accommodation. I just, you know, this is, this is where I get old man, get off my lawn. Like, why does everything have to be a meme now? Um, you can make this a meme right now. Um, but, you know, we could meme this in the sense of like, look at Artemis of Ephesus. You know, like, here's Artemis of Ephesus. And if you've, if you've seen that, it, you can... You can stumble onto a statue in the, in the, in the um, Vatican Museum. And it's this God, this fertility God with all these breasts everywhere. And there is a kind of sense of we think this is what will save us. If we could just create churches that have all these resources. And yet Artemis of Ephesus, like I don't want to get into the mythology around her because I don't, I don't know enough, but there isn't a lot of grace in the midst of it. It's like she is a God who punishes and she's a God who gives and takes away and, pun you know, and you think the same of Baal here, like Baal in the cycle of death to come back and, you know, you have to, you have to serve this. But then if you, you're walking around the, the Vatican Museum, you'll also stumble on all these Renaissance pictures of the Madonna and the child. And that's a very different picture of the Madonna in the child and the fertility God. The fertility God is growth of more, more of the cult, more of capital in our time, where the Madonna and the child is a growth into something. So Christianity has a fundamental commitment to growth, but it isn't growth into more and more. It's a growth into, into Jesus Christ, into the spirit. So what I want us to do with innovation, however we use it, we use it where we don't, is make it about the growth into this union of the spirit, this union of one another, the growth into commitment, responsibility, advocacy for your neighbor, um, into personhood, as opposed to more relevance, more resources. And the problem is in this capitalist age, if we don't redefine that in some way or give people narratives or images to see that, they will always think it means, okay, if we do this, we can get we can get 12% growth um, or we can, you know, we can, we can feel, and, and I actually want us to honor those people who think that because what they are thinking is I would like this church to be there to bury me. I would like this church to be there for my grandkids. My father gave money for this pulpit and I would like this to continue. That's all a good and we should honor that, but it does get sucked into this logic that we got to grow. We have to grow the capital. Um, and I do think Christianity, we, we shouldn't shy away from we're about growth, but it's really growth into as opposed of something. So I'm curious. Um, I think there's a similarity, even though you t both talk about it or the two uh, books talk about it very differently and you're thinking about it. There's a being and doing element here, right? There's, there's a relational 
God, you are God's beloved. Um, uh, you cannot save yourself. That is recognized here. And what we do uh, comes out of that encounter, that awakening, that moment. It is not the point. And it's got to drive us back to the being, the relational, the, the ministry in and for um, the neighbor and the, the good in the world. Right. I mean, I mean, there's there's a lot of themes through here. One of the things that I I just want to just drop into within that is I think a myth that exists in the church and you both you all agree on this, I think, like leaders can't just work harder and the burnout and the and the all the things that have come with that. We we're seeing it in spades. How would you speak? to that leader today, because the bottom line is it's going to take a long time to change the church, right? This, but there's a moment that, that leaders are just drowning and they need, they need, I want to go into this hopeful future. Give me something in this moment that is an anchor or a lifeline for me to stay in the midst as this paradigm is shifting. One way to come after that would be when you're pastoring or if you're a lay leader in your church, you've been working really hard and maybe you're not seeing the things that you hoped for, the reminder that I, th I hope you hear from all of us today on this podcast is that it really isn't up to us. We can't make it grow anyway. Um, we can't fix it. We can't design the right app to get the people the things. Um, we're dependent on God. And God isn't always that predictable. God is loving. God is kind. God is merciful. God is also holy and completely other than us. And so if we think we're going to control God, we're, from the Christian perspective, we're, we're wrong. And I can confess from my own leadership experience as a sort of high-achieving, high-driven personality type, it's so much easier for me when I feel stuck I'm imagining the people that Andy mentioned who are coming to conferences trying to find the right solution to the things, and you feel stuck, and you feel like you've tried things, and it hasn't worked. You don't know what to do. Maybe it's even your job. I'd much rather work harder than wait for whatever it is God's going to bring up, because what if God brings nothing up? How do I explain that to my supervisor? What if I have to wait a really long time? What if the thing God creates doesn't actually address the problem that I thought we had in the first place. I can't control God. I can control my own effort. So I think the hope is give up on being the solution. Just help yourself. Give yourself the grace that God gives you and give up on being the answer person, the person who has to solve everything, and reframe your own understanding of your role as someone who's there to participate in whatever it is that God is doing. And you have certain gifts. That's the reason God's called you there. You can use those gifts, but the results are not up to you. The results are up to God. And if there aren't other people who are going to journey with you, then there isn't a way to do it. And in fact, if you work really hard to try to do it for them, you're not succeeding. You're doing them a disservice. They are not going to grow in their own relationship with God if you try to do things that they are unwilling or unable to do. So give up on that. And I, I found a lot of freedom as a pastor to just say, that's just not my job. <laughs> and, and people are plenty confused by that because they think it is your job. And it's helpful to say out loud, like, I, I can't fix that. I can try to point myself and you to the grace of God and to a willingness to genuinely listen and try something, knowing it might not solve our problem. And at least for me, that was hopeful because this burden I felt on my shoulders got lifted. I can't fix this anyway, but I can play the role that God has called me to play and then see what happens. And it might be great and it might be hard. I don't know. But that's the journey. Can we also note that took you back into heating and cooling? <laughs> and out of a yeah. church. I mean, business leadership 
if anyone's listening who leads a business or is helpful in doing that, it isn't any different. There's a million business books that try to tell you the same thing. The, the core lie of the age is if you do it smart enough and work hard enough, you can do anything. And that's just not true. You can't. So as a business Christian trying to be a Christian business leader, you say, God, I, I don't know. I can't fix this either. But these are my gifts. This is well, my calling. And I'm going to try to step into it today. And part of why I bring that up is I think some of the freedom is going to come in bivocational ministry leadership yeah. where, where churches can afford. And that's a gift. Yeah. A full-time person. And they're having to rethink the whole thing and share it. Like it leans into something different. This is probably a different podcast, but my 30 seconds on that is if we can change the expectations of paid staff people by either making them bivocational or redefining their job descriptions in ways that everybody understands, we can empower them to do some ministry work that currently they don't have the time or energy to do because they're too busy opening the doors, closing the doors, making sure the place functions. And that's not the work we need them to do and actually to help us move forward as a community. So I'll just add a couple things. Um, and this is give yourself as a leader and give your community permission to streamline and prune and stop doing things because the temptation is to get busier, to add more. And that is the least helpful thing right now if you are trying to learn, help your community learn how to follow God. And so, um, so even post-pandemic now, a lot of churches had the temptation, oh, let's just re, like get all that stuff going again. Really do discernment around um, what can we stop doing to create the space spiritually in the and emotionally and otherwise in the life of and temporally in the life of the community to do a different set of practices because a lot of the practices that we've inherited that um, we have been busy about in church aren't actually helping people learn how to obey and follow God in daily life or live into the story of scripture um, they're doing other things that might be good but um but not actually uh, helping us move forward. So, so we, we often say, and I think we say this in the book, that most churches we know are doing too many things. So um, I find, you know, John 15, the vine and branches and rerooting and abiding in the vine and the true vine and the pruning, even every branch that bears fruit, Jesus, you know, God prunes. Um, to bear more fruit. And um, if we think of that, not in a capitalist growth sense, but in a, but in a spiritual sense, um, I think that's really important. And, and I think just having clarity around, well, following Jesus, like what does a Jesus-shaped life like actually look like? What are some contours of that, some dimensions of that? Can we be explicit about that? Helps people at least have a sense of um, what does that journey look like? And then what are the really simple practices that we orient the community's life around helping people do to live into that, which may not be a rummage sale or the altar guild and like all the committees and things that we've inherited. Yeah, I think this is where we, the three of us really agree. I mean, I, I think to build on that, there's a, there's a phrase that I've been told that's come through like uh, oral history from this place, a, a Luther Seminary, a pedagogical phrase that uh, the great uh, Don Jewell used to say in his classrooms here as great New Testament professor when he would say, if it's not going well, and he's talking about in the classroom, if it's not going well, I'm working too hard. That was his kind of phrase. And what that meant for him is that he had to kind of not drown people with more information and more processes, but to listen, to uh, hear from his students, to create more of a communio in the in the classroom. And I do think that's part of, we could learn that right now. Like if it's not going well in pastoral ministry, um, you're working too hard. You know, like stop, um, open your hands or, or, you know, put down your hands and, uh, and wait, wait on God and uh, attend to the people around you. I mean, I think that is the most core innovative process. And I see what you guys are getting at is just attend to the relationships around you, those in, in the neighborhood. Um, and there is a certain anthropology I play in that too, which is there's no such thing as people who are not connected 
to other people in the world through your congregation. I mean, there's people all over the place. It's like when when congregations tell me, we have no children in our church. Like that's utter BS. I mean, you have neighbors who they don't come to this church. They're not members. So, may, you know, that's why you think you have no children, but you all have grandchildren that you that need to be prayed for and, and, and held. And, and so what does it mean to really attend to those kind of relationships? And I think sometimes we want to do so much that we are doing too much. It's not going well because we're because um, you're working too hard and to actually turn into attend to the relationships around you. I'll just add one last thing to say. You know, Jesus is not worried. <laughs> I mean that. Did you get an email bibli- on that? No, this just week? biblically, literally, <laughs> Jesus is telling us, "Don't worry." And I will be with you to the end of the age. When I hear I've him say, that. "You know, hey, yeah, I, I've been here before. Yeah. I understand all of the forces that are impacting you on a daily basis, even if you can't parse them as well as Andy can. I understand them." And if the only thing you can do today is trust me or renew your trust in me, I know the way out. And, you know, the best thing about being a Christian is that we're not actually leading this thing. We're followers of Jesus. And Jesus has been here before. So uh, I think there is a lot of hope in we're not the answer. And it doesn't take understanding everything at the deepest level in order to be able to love your neighbor, love God, and invest in people around you. So I hear as we're talking about this pivot from fixing to listening and discerning, a theme that you both or all of us agree on here is that if the leader's work is this interpretive space making, holding an environment where we can be listening and wondering what God, what might be God inviting us into. Um, that's the worthy thing. That's the center of, of what this, this work is. And there's a lot of ways that we can get there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some new questions to ask some new practices. There's some questioning of like, what is going on around us? And is that really helpful? Right. I think there's critique that is worthy of just, you know, adding another thing. Um, I'm going to give each of you one last opportunity to say something to our listeners. What's one thing you'd like that hasn't been said yet or you want to reiterate from what we talked about today as we think about um, this pivot in the church today? So I'll just begin and with a story that we include in the book, which is um, a meeting that I was in with some denominational like judicatory level leaders some years ago where we had asked them all to come with a, like a, just two pager of like, what's the reality of the congregate at the grassroots level of the congregations in your systems. And they would say, you know, X number of de- growing, declining, all this stuff. And this one group came and said, bravely, most of our congregations can identify their source of hope. And so if that applies, if you're honest with yourself to your congregation, And even to you as a leader, as these cultural narratives that Andy's so well described shape us to to have to be the the ones who save and and fix and all of that, then um, our hope is in God, precisely in our worst. That's our story. And so... um, So I I think the hope word is really important to claim, but to be very careful about how we define. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to this. Listening to this means you're investing in your own leadership and trying to figure out the best way forward for yourself and other people. I know that there's been a lot of conversation about folks wanting to not do this anymore. I had a pastor who trained me who said you should always have a job in mind that you (laughs) would do if you weren't doing this anymore. Um, As someone who has done a lot of jobs in a lot of different sectors of society, it is so essential to have great leadership in congregations. So essential. And in having been in hundreds, if not thousands of churches in my life, when you see healthy leaders who are serving faithfully and pointing people to God, it's amazing. There is no other organization like the church when it's at its best, 
representing God in the world, uh, bringing about health and wholeness in the lives of the people around them. It's the best. So we're so thankful for all that you do, and we recognize the many long hours and the many efforts that nobody else sees. We see them. We know about them, and we're thankful for them. Well, my word will not be as positive as that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have gone before me. I know, we should have known that. That was really beautifully wrapped up. So maybe as they edit this, they can displace <laughs> ours, ours in, or maybe not. But um, I think what's been really nice for me about this conversation, I, I do think we've come to a place of, of um, and I think we knew this was going to happen, but of, of agreeing on a lot. And there is a kind of position of receiving that that we want to be at and and uh you know um asking people to wait and to trust um but i guess what i would want to leave people with is there is that disposition of do less of um you know um that you can't save this institution but to ask the question what is god up to what is god's god doing and that's why to do less so that you can you can hear that but that is a fundamentally courageous question and there's a reason that a lot of pastors don't want to ask it or a lot of theologians don't want to teach you to ask it is because to ask that question um is very dangerous to ask what is god doing because what god is doing is taking what's dead and making it alive and so to try to find where god is at work is going to lead you um into having to walk into death for the sake of proclaiming the hope that Dwight's talking about. So this should be, I think, where we all agree is on this interpretive reality that at the core, your leadership is about asking, what is God doing? But I want to remind us as we leave that that is a, um, there's freedom in that. That doesn't ask you to do more, but it does ask you to have to see differently. And it does ask you to have to bear something. And it does ask you to follow to the cross. And uh, that. That is that is a big burden, and you can't do that alone. So you're going to need colleagues. You're going to need conversations. You're going to need uh, to be pastored yourself. Um, but it's not about optimizing and winning Ws. It's about bearing death for the sake of life. It's about walking um, with that mother who just got word that her that her uh, that her child's got cancer. Um, it's about standing with um, that spouse who's about to bury um, someone they've lived with for 40 years. It's, it's about helping people to live well and, and, and to die um, in the embrace of, of Jesus Christ. Well, I get to work with these gentlemen and we get to have these kind of conversations in places here. What I'm grateful for, for this podcast in general, but for today specifically, we are called to steward the future witness of this amazing gospel. And I think this is a hard time to lead. And it's a really exciting time. Because when you lay it down and you sit with that family, it, there's nothing more powerful, right? And that's how this momentum, this how the turn happens. So I thank you for engaging with one another. And to our listeners, uh, we have a gift for you in addition to this podcast is that we have one free chapter out of the book that um, we talked about leading faithful innovation that you can find by looking at the show notes and how to download that. And for those of you listening here, you can help us spread the word. If you're watching us on YouTube, please uh, subscribe and make sure you can get future episodes. If you're listening on any of our podcast platforms, please leave us a review. That really helps us in our work here. And finally, you've heard this before if you've listened. The best compliment you can give us is to share this, this episode with someone that it might really be powerful for. So please do that. Get the word out. So till our next episode, this is Terry Elton signing out for another Pivot Podcast.